Thank you so much for choosing to worship with us today. We are closed for in-person worship and any activities inside our building at First United Methodist Church. Chrissy, our administrative assistant, is here Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to noon, if you need assistance. We are holding our Christmas services as planned, but we have moved them to the parking lot. We're asking that you dress for the weather, masking and social distancing required. You can sign up for one of those 10 Christmas services online at our website or by calling the church office. Thanks again for joining us. Jesus said that people will know we are Christians by our love. If we love others, we are going to care about them more than we do for ourselves. You have probably been spending some money on Christmas presents for people you love and people who love you. What would your Christmas be like if you bought a present for someone who does not like you? Give it a try. Jesus told us to love our enemies. It's not easy, but he helps us to forgive and forget. Today, we light our second Advent candle to remind us of the love that Jesus brings. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, teach us how to love like you love, even when it's hard, even. Rejoice, rejoice. 
first Christmas. When all through the town not a creature was stirring, there was not a sound. The moon shining bright and the heavens so high gave the luster of midday to the Bethlehem sky. The animals were nestled in warm, cozy places with looks of contentment on each of their faces. But and now I have to eat now because the Bible tells us so. <laughs> and Mary and Joseph so tried from the road. They had just settled into a humble abode. And then the stable, a baby's first cry, peace on earth for redemption is nigh. He had not a crib, but a manger instead, the tiny new baby lie down his sweet head. But Noah, how do you know? Because the Bible tells us so. Mary looked down at his cute little mouth and silently counted ten fingers, ten toes. As shepherds kept watch on a small nearby hill, there were sheep were all silent and sleepy and still. When suddenly in the sky there arose at your sight one angel, then many appeared in the night. But Noah, how do you know? Because the Bible tells us so. Let's keep reading. The heavens rejoiced as their story unfurled. A baby a savior had been born to the world. So the shepherds arose to search for the place to get a close look at the baby's sweet face. Then out of the east there came a worldly whose mission was finding the savior, you see. When they finally found the stable they had sought gold frankincense and myrrh for the gifts they had brought. So the wise men bowed down and praised his sweet name soon all those who heard would rejoice that came that he came. And now we know that we can say with delight. Jesus was born on the first Christmas night. Jabe, now do you understand the story? Yes. Bye. Icy wind made moan Earth stood hard as iron Water like a stone Snow on snow had fallen Snow on snow on snow In the Worship the beloved.
heaven cannot hold him, nor can earth sustain. Heaven and earth shall fall away when he comes to What then can I give him, empty as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would. What then can I give him? I must give my heart. Will you please join me in prayer? God, we come to you today with so many things on our hearts. We come to you with our sorrows and our disappointments that have been this entire year, but especially this time of year when we have so many traditions that we won't be able to celebrate with family and friends. But God, most of all, we come to you with a plea, a plea that your healing touch, that your peace rain down around us. As persons fall ill all across our county, our state, and our country, God, we pray for those persons to receive care. We pray for all of the healthcare workers who are working overtime and double shifts and not getting their days off and, and are not seeing an end in sight, God. Give them strength. Give them your peace. God, we pray for those for whom the holidays are not cheery. We pray for those who are struggling this year with buying presents or food. God, and we pray for the children. The children at this time of year that maybe this year more than ever, they will have to sacrifice and do without, without really knowing why. God, you are the great comforter, the great provider. Open each of our eyes to how we can share your love this season and always. We give you thanks for your son, Jesus, who came to make us whole and save us from ourselves. In your name we pray. Amen. Hello, my name is Lauren Barger. And I'm Alexis Barger, and today we are going to be reading from the Bible. We are going to be reading Zechariah chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. The word of the Lord Almighty came to me. This is what the word of the Lord Almighty said. I am very jealous for Zion. I am burning with jealousy for her. This is what the Lord says. I will return to Zion and dwell in Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the faithful city, and the mountain of the Lord Almighty will be called the holy mountain. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Once again, men and women, ripe of old age, will sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each of them with a cane in their hand because of their age. The cities will be filled with boys and girls playing there. This is what the Lord of the world Almighty says. It may seem marvelous to me of his of this people at that time, but will it seem marvelous to me? declares the Lord Almighty. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will save my people from the countries of the east and the west. I will bring them back to, to live in Jerusalem 
They will be my people, and I will be faithful and righteousness to them as their God. So, is there anybody sick and tired of this pandemic? I mean, enough already? Two years ago, Karen and I traveled to Dallas, Texas for a time of training. And while we were in Texas, our children were staying with some friends, uh, former parishioners. And if you don't know, my children are homeschooled. And so they continue wherever they are, their education comes. And so those friends were leading them through their assignments. For the older kids, they were pretty fine. They did everything they were supposed to. But for Annalise, my youngest, she just grew very weary of the whole thing. I mean, that's probably the longest she had been away from mom and dad. But um, those friends were trying to get her to do her preschool assignment and to work at it. And she looked at them. She gave them this look and said, I'm sick of it. They, they still laugh about that today. But I think when it comes to this pandemic, there's a whole lot of people who are ready to look and say, I'm sick of it, right? Had enough. Um, It's been a strange week with church staff. You know, normally we'll have a meeting. People are rather cooperative and jovial and joyful. And at the last meeting, you could have cut the tension with a knife. I mean, people are kind of edgy, They're just, things aren't normal. Everything's changing around that and that the stress levels are like up to here, right? So I think for a lot of people, wherever you work in the life of your family, you're you're experiencing that same kind of angst. It's just upsetting in many ways. But if you can relate to those feelings, then you have a a lot in common with the people of Zachariah's day. This was a period in history Whenever the temple had been destroyed, Jerusalem itself is in ruins. It's just a horrific time for the nation of Judah. And so for Zechariah, I mean, this is the last book of the, New, of the Old Testament before the New Testament begins. I mean, he and Haggai, the, the two of them are contemporaries. And a lot of the reason for their writing, they're trying to urge and inspire the people to rebuild the temple. But more than just rebuilding the temple, there's really a need for them to rebuild their identity because so much that is normal for them has been thrown out the window and they need to know once again as the people of God uh, who they are. And something beautiful about Zechariah are the number of visions that he shares and his prophetic word paints a picture of a preferred future for these people of God and what they can look forward to. So uh, I think it's not just a picture for them, but even for us in the United States of America in this day and age, I think this is a prophetic word for us. Why? Um, Because I think in so many ways, our nation is in ruins. You know, once upon a time, we had a strong Judeo-Christian value system that in many ways thrown out the window. We could say at one time we are one nation under God, indivisible. But, um, man, never seen so much division as there is right now. And I don't know about you, but I don't even want to watch the news anymore because I have this struggle. Is, Is this true? Is this partially true? Is this total nonsense? Because I hear something here, and then I hear the complete opposite over there, and we're kind of wondering, well, what, what is going on? What is this the discrepancy? Uh, my grandmother used to say, don't believe anything you hear and only half of what you see. And um, as things go on, I think, well, that, that makes a lot of sense because, man, it, it's just hard to, to know. But um, I think we need a little dose of hope like Zechariah is offering. So hopefully some of the words in this, this letter can encourage us. Uh, one thing the prophet shares for those people, they're going to go from this time of fasting to actual feasting. Certainly they're, they're in ruins, despair and brokenness, but God is once again going to dwell among them. God is going to restore Zion to its beauty and so because of that, there's, there is hope. Even shares that um, the most vulnerable of the population don't have anything to worry about. 
He refers to old men and old women who perhaps would be fearful of losing their lives in the current context, but Zechariah's reminding them they're going to have long life. And then he gives this unique image. There will be children playing in the streets. I mean, if there's warfare that's going on around you, are children playing in the streets? No. If, if there's disease and threat of it, are children going to be playing in the streets? No. If there's suffering and difficulty and hardship and frustration, are children going to be playing in the streets? No. This image of children at play is really this reminder that it's a period of complete joy, complete calm, The symbolism that Zechariah is sharing is reminding us, yeah, that's the way it should be. Have you watched children play lately? They're not concerned about where their next meal is coming from or all these stresses, you know. It seems that when they're at play, there's not a, a care in the world. And boy, if we could get there, huh? In this day and age, huh? Not a care in the world. Do you know there are some people who actually study play? I was reading about Dr. Bowen White, a physician. He's actually someone who helped to co found the National Institute for Play. It's a nonprofit organization that researches play and the benefits of it. Listen to some of his words. We all come into the world knowing how to play. As adults, we shouldn't feel like we have to grow out of it. Play is essential to our health. If you want to have a fun life, you can't have a fun life without play. Face it, too much stress is not good for us. See, the more that we're at play, the more we spend time laughing. And the more that we are laughing, the more healthy it is for us. Even the blood flow increases within us when we have a good hearty laugh. And so I think often as adults, we are too stressed out, too busy, too unwilling to actually just go play, go enjoy ourselves, go kick back, as this season of Christmas is soon approaching. Don't we yearn for a sense of peace and joy when we're at that place where it seems we don't have a care in the world? Uh, we yearn for a place where our, our hopes aren't dashed. We yearn for a day when we don't have to wear masks anymore where we don't have to maintain this six or 12 foot social distance from somebody else. But we yearn for this time when we can just run up to hug whoever we want to hug for however long we want to hug. We yearn for a time to be free of this risk of disease. And bigger than that, don't we yearn for a time when there's no more war? And no more bloodshed. And no more death or sorrow or, or pain. Christmas is less than three weeks away, but this Advent season reminds us that it, Jesus is coming back. That we need to, to be ready for that. But we know one day he, he will make all things right again that wrongs will be made right, that that peace and joy truly will come. And we need that, don't we? Back in 1992, Amy Grant released a song that quickly became a favorite of so many. It's called Grown Up Christmas List. You heard it before? Let me share the lyrics. Do you remember me? I sat upon your knee. I wrote to you with childhood fantasies. 
Well, I'm all grown up now and still need help somehow. I'm not a child, but my heart still can dream. So here's my lifelong wish, my grown-up Christmas list. Not for myself, but for a world in need. No more lives torn apart. And wars would never start. And time would heal our hearts. And everyone would have a friend. And right would always win. And love would never end. This is my grown-up Christmas list. You know, I think I would add one additional thing to that list. How about more play? As you're counting down these days to Christmas and probably overstressed and overwhelmed and just sick of it, my challenge for you, here's your homework. I want you to spend some time at play. Do something that makes you laugh. Do something that puts this huge smile on your face. Just Throw all that work stuff or that stressful stuff just off to the side for a little while. You heard of the Google company? You know what they do? They're so big a proponent of this that they actually work play into the workplace. There at their corporate headquarters, there are foosball tables, ping pong tables, pool tables, snacks for free. People are encouraged to continue to play And they find that their work effort is excellent because they have this good balance of work and play. I don't know about you, but I need to work on that. And when my youngest, Annalise, says, Daddy, would you play with me? Instead of saying, oh, just after I finish this or this or or that, I'm going to drop what I'm doing and play something we all need. Zechariah gives us this beautiful image of children at play in the streets. May that be a hope for all of us, that as the joy and the peace of Christ surround us, and we're, we're not so caught up in all that's wrong, but we, we see what's right. May we as children play and frolic in God's presence until we one day see him face to face. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to celebrate communion, so if you want to get some elements, whatever you have, bread and juice or crackers and juice, um, we'll be fine. When we celebrate communion, we are remembering the sacrifice that Jesus made of himself for all of us. That in this moment, we are all children of God. And as we celebrate Christmas through the eyes of a child with our theme, we, we have asked you to go and get crackers or juice or bread and juice or bread and coffee, whatever you have in your house, because it's not really the exact elements that we use. It is the meaning behind our words and how we remember what Christ did for us. And so we take time and we ask God to forgive our sins that we have committed. And then we prepare the, what we are using for our elements for communion. And today I am using graham cracker, and a juice box. Because our intent is that we will remember the sacrifice of Jesus no matter what our elements are. So if you remember, we we celebrate communion because Jesus did. He was having his last supper with his disciples and they were eating around a table and Jesus picked up a loaf of bread. So this symbolizes our loaf of bread today. Jesus picked up a loaf of bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. And so he broke it and then he gave it to his disciples in that room. And he said, whenever you eat this, remember me. And then he took, he was using wine, but we always use juice. He took the juice 
that was a part of the meal and he said, this is my blood shed for you. Every time you drink this, remember me. And what he was doing was drawing the connection between his sacrifice for us and the sacrifice that he made for us and the eternal love that comes with that sacrifice. So I invite you now to take a bite of your cracker, your bread, what have you, and remember that Jesus gave himself for us. And to take a drink of your drink in order that we remember Christ's sacrifice. We know that God is with us, that God has, his spirit is around us, reminding us how much Jesus loves us, and this proves that. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, and how when we celebrate communion, no matter what elements we're using, that with our hearts, it connects us to you. Amen and amen. Come.
thank you for your generosity, all the ways that you're helping us be the church. Um, for many college students, it's a challenging time, but um, there are care packages that are being sent out to them, uh, reminding them that they have a church family that loves them and wants to encourage and support them. So thank you for all the ways that you give and how that's making a difference. Uh, would you receive the benediction? Go forth now frolicking in God's presence, knowing that as peace and joy is brought alive in your own heart, you can share that peace and joy with all the world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.